Welcome well, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming out. Uh, my name is Martin uh, Klimke and on behalf of the NYU Abu Dhabi Institute, I welcome you to our humble dwellings here in New York City. Uh, thanks so much for coming. Uh, we uh, put this evening together uh, because we wanted to showcase one of um, the products of a very, very long collaboration between NYU Abu Dhabi and NYU New York and NYU Shanghai, a truly you know, research-driven collaboration that resulted in this wonderful book that you see um, Which I'll here. pass around so people can look at it if they want. And just in case you're wondering, we're not selling the book here because it's completely shamelessly overpriced. Um, so the ebook version is for $30, so we would encourage you to, you know, if you're interested, uh, peruse that particular option instead. Um, but what we want to do tonight is talk a little bit about, you know, um, the book itself, how it came about, you know, what kind of research collaboration this was embedded in, uh, and give you a little bit more um, of a background of why we think this particular book uh, represents a, a global intervention um, in the area of 60s historiography. Uh, but before we get to that, you know, we really want to thank, you know, our um, hosts here at the NYU Abu Dhabi Institute, which this year, at this particular week, essentially celebrates its 10th anniversary. Uh, the NYU Abu Dhabi Institute is a platform for advanced research, uh, hosts conferences, hosts events like that, both in Abu Dhabi and in New York. Yeah, so we're very, very happy to be here. We also want to thank the history department here at NYU New York. Uh, for sponsoring, co-sponsoring both this event and this research collaboration, which led to the book, um, as well as NYU Shanghai, um, uh, John Avery Cohen um, has been an uh, instrumental part of this particular process. Um, Sponsored well. one of the two conferences exactly. from which this book came. We also want to thank the Graduate Research Initiative here at NYU uh, in New York, uh, which. Uh, was the third key funder of the conferences that led to this volume. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about the global 60s. You know, one of the things uh, that we started out with was in 2015 the idea, let's do something for the anniversary. You know, 50th anniversary of 1968. Um, you know, what are we going to do that adds value to that particular celebratory you know year of commemorating the 60s? Um, you know, in this particular. Um, uh, year. So one of the things that we came up with at that particular point was that the global 60s has been, in the imagination of participants at that time, you know, a really, really driving force. You have here a quotation from Rudy Dutschke, a West German student leader uh, from the Vietnam Congress, who talks about the globalization of revolutionary forces in the face of counter-revolution um, is the task for the 60s moving forward. And the idea was truly in the eyes of on the one hand, to come up with a global revolutionary strategy. On the other hand, however, the establishment also had an eye towards the global dimension of the 60s. You have here an excerpt from uh, the CAA report that was presented to the uh, Prince, uh, President Johnson's cabinet in September 1868 that talks about the global dimension of 60s activism as a threat to US foreign policy um, conducted on a global level. Yeah? So the idea was that we're seeing a process here that is unfolding you know, in the Western countries that is, however, reaching out to the um, underdeveloped countries as the CIA called it um, at that particular point in time. Uh, we just lost uh, the visual here, but that's okay. We can <laughs> show on the corner. <laughs> So, and one of the things that we immediately called into question as we talked about this was the sort of Eurocentrism of the, the historiography of 68. Although it talked about itself as part of a globalizing revolutionary force, it was imagined as something that began in North America and Western Europe and spread outward. And it also gave uh, an enormous importance to the iconic year of 68. And one of the things we came to do, as we'll show, is to decenter both of those, um, both the geographic focus uh, and uh, the focus on the year 68 as opposed to a longer 1960s. Exactly. And one of the sort of typical stories of you know 60s globalism was you know starting with Western icons such as the Beat Generation, or you know, intellectual, artistic avant-garde such as the Soviet <coughs> International, and essentially projecting onto them a global, you know, so that the impulse 
poor rebellion would be situated and the western would then spread you know all across the rest of the world and uh, one of the things if any of you have followed the numerous commemorations in u.s and european uh, magazines of 68 it still has very much this kind of narrative embedded in it um, so one of the things that we are trying to advance with this particular book is not to say that these particular movements didn't matter as sources of inspiration, but there is a very different kind of genealogy and a very different kind of transnational you know, adoption and rejection process in place. So what we're trying to do in the book is highlight non-Western examples of 60s activism and are looking at the ways in which activists from around the world, Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, engaged with movements in the West, but also fought their own battles, fought their own struggles that may or may not have been connected to what we commonly associate with the 60s. So the idea is really to flip the coin. And to really look at not the flows that have been somewhat studied from the global north uh, to the global south, but to look at the whole variety of South-South connections, exchanges, networks across which people, protest forms, uh, cultural products, uh, and <coughs> ideologies moved in incredibly complex ways. And the idea is not only to use then the Cold War as a framework of reference here, but also look at other processes, you know, such as decolonization, look at the non-alignment movement, and try to think about <coughs> ways in which they were influential for the activists in the West. They actually provided the stimulus for a lot of these activists um, to essentially rebel and you know question the very concept of the Cold War. So this is something that we're trying to do. We are essentially, as you'll see if you flip through these images, also trying to establish an alternative visual canon of the decade. Uh, and that will become clear as we move forward uh, and are looking at events that were formative you know, in this particular era, such as this one, the Tricontinental, um, in January 1966 in Atlanta. Which produced some amazing iconography, including uh, the image that is the cover uh, mm -hmm. of our volume, um, okay. and which had text in many languages on that image, but it made the cover too busy. But essentially, they all said the same thing. Humanity says, enough. So, so that's the idea. And you know, we essentially, in the book, we go through a variety of access points you know, through that particular argument. We have various um, thematic approaches to the um, particular issue of the global 60s, as well as three long um, geographical sections on Asia, Africa, <coughs> and the Middle East. The thematic sections range from uh, an exploration of various transnational spaces, which were the sites of uh, protest, uh, of uh, transnational exchanges, of new cultural forms, uh, looking at culture, counterculture, and politics. Uh, stepping back and looking some at the international order and economics. Uh, what are some of our other sections I'm blanking at the moment? On uh, women, gender, uh, and uh, early feminist protest. Um, yeah. And wars and civil wars. Because one of the things we want to do is both emphasize the importance globally of the Vietnam War but also put back into the center various civil wars and struggles for national liberation uh, that occurred at the same time and that in some areas were as formative, if not more formative, than the Vietnam War itself. So in many ways, this is an attempt to sort of question or expand and enrich existing narratives you know, that are out there. For example, with regard to the lifestyle and counterculture of the 60s, we're all familiar with these particular images, um, you know, Bob Dylan, John Baez, Jimi Hendrix, so again, we're not saying that these were insignificant even for other parts around the world, but that a completely one-sided, one-dimensional Western perspective on this particular decade you know, essentially marginalizes um, other perspectives that could help illuminate the globality to a much larger extent than it has previously done. So for example, in this area, we have a wonderful contribution by Ophelia Rillon, uh, who talks about Mali and the ways in which fashion in Mali reconstituted or constituted a space, you know, for the young people to express themselves, you know, in a way that was not necessarily tied to the kinds of you know cultural politics that we see in the West. 
And that we found in other places as well, looking at both, we have an essay that looks at the Beats and the later Hippies uh, in the Soviet Union. The former seen themselves as part of uh, the very early 60s cultural politics. The Hippies not imagining themselves as separate or a commune in uh, El Salvador, uh, which was not part of the political struggles of the period, but imagined itself as really opting out and was often criticized by more political forces. So the attempt is also to is essentially um, try to look at the local dimension of whatever we want to you know, consider the globality of the 60s and try to unearth the local dimensions you know, in each and every <coughs> Uh, and it's a collection, you know, as an aggregation of all of these stories, you know, a very different kind of global 60s narrative emerges um, as a result. Again, this is kind of this transnational solidarity that we are used to. We have the iconic Gani Kovendit in there, Tariq Ali, and then our usual suspects. All those men in the 60s. Oh, it's a gender dimension here very, very clearly. So I think there's, there's a lot of things that we already know and that is firmly enshrined in the historiography of the 60s. No thanks or not least due to the fact that a lot of these participants, you know, have of course, trying to, have been trying to keep alive the legacy of the histories and the struggles, but they have also, you know, tended to have a very, very limited, you know, view on their experience of the 60s. So what's happened since the 90s already is that the historiography and scholarship has emancipated itself, you know, from these narratives that were purely driven by activists, not in the sense of marginalizing these voices, but trying sort of to come to the uh, research of the 60s with new questions, with new ideas, and try to make it a little bit more um, expansive. So, I mean, one of the things we've tried to do is look at protests that went on in various places across the global south uh, that uh, were relating as much to local issues uh, as to some of the concerns uh, of those protesting in Berlin uh, or uh, Berkeley uh, or Paris. Um, so we look at some of the Latin American movements. We look at a variety of protests and conflicts in Africa, places like Dakar, uh, playing a very major role uh, in those protests, and moving from there to other parts uh, of uh, Francophone Africa. Uh, we look at protest movements in the Middle East, uh, recovering uh, the various attempts, and Toby Nats has a very interesting essay uh, in the volume on efforts to create a kind of red Arabia in Yemen uh, and Oman, uh, and the repression uh, of that that went on between the mid-60s and the mid-70s. And in the process of that, I think, you know, um, several of our contributors came up with typologies, you know, of transnational connections that work, you know, for their own specific locales, but also, you know, could be elevated to, you know, re-examine the history um, of the global 60s in a way um, that would be more inclusive of the diversity of experiences here. So Victoria Langman, for example, a historian of Brazil, came up with this particular um, typology namely saying that there are literal you know, transnational connections that involve the movement of ideas, cultural practices, and people, that they are sort of aspirational or imagined and desired solidarities and similarities. And Maoism that, being one of the major examples of that, on um, something onto which a variety of groups projected uh, hopes, aspirations, uh, and, and on the basis of very little knowledge about what Maoism or the Cultural Revolution uh, were about, but nonetheless created very real <laughs> affinities and affiliations. Yeah, and the idea was that they also encountered, of course, a response. And you know? so that what she terms conspiratorial refers to you know, ideas such as the ones that put forward by the CIA and others that are looking at the globality of transnational connections that are also imagined or real. Uh, and plus, of course, you know, that the fact that um, in the aftermath of the 60s, um, as they enter the cultural memory, you know, there have been also these commemorative, you know, transnational connections. So trying to disentangle all of these particular typologies and the way in which they mutually reinforce each other and, you know, um, trying to unpack those in every locale, that's one of the ideas, one of the thrusts, if you like, of this particular and uh, book. Among the conspiratorial kind of connections are some very interesting ones that contributors uh, discovered. Uh, a farm youth program, because the American government was very concerned that 
uh, the overwhelmingly peasant countries of Asia might become susceptible uh, to the appeals of Marxism, so they tried to bring a mixture of modernization theory and liberalism in these exchanges between young American farmers and young farmers from the Philippines uh, and uh, Korea. Uh, with what success is very hard to know. The Peace Corps was another example of those uses and not surprisingly among the largest and first Peace Corps programs were in Iran and Ethiopia, two areas about which the US was very concerned. So you'll find a lot of images of the book. <coughs> Around 150 images, you know, that are you know official images, uh, that are sort of underground uh, press images, uh, a lot of countercultural um, images. You find a lot from Cuba, from Havana, as well as China. Just to give you a few examples, because we really wanted to flesh out the ways in which those images circulated, and not yet have another volume on Paris, you know, on Kent State, on you know the typical areas and locales of protest establish essentially another visual canon here. So this is essentially <laughs> one of the things that happened during the conference was very interesting uh, in Abu Dhabi was that um, there was a little bit of a, I want to say, creative difference you know, between the people working uh, in the 60s in you know, various parts of the world and the Africanists who essentially said, what are you talking about? Our 60s experience is nation building. It's dealing with decolonization. It's not sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Yeah? So there was a clear divide among you know, different academic cultures, all historians, that had to do with the fact that you know, we're coming at it from a very different perspective and you know, assumptions. We had a similar discussion about Maoism, you know, um, its global circulation, and then its sort of local brand in China. And so this project, as much as uh, it is about sort of the scholarly intervention is also about bridging academic cultures of divides and starting a conversation. And I think the African contributions are among the most original in the book. They're done overwhelmingly by uh, young scholars. Um, and it's really pathbreaking in the research they're doing, whether it's on Rhodesia or Senegal or Mali or the Congo in the aftermath uh, of uh, Lumumba's death. Um, it's really uh, Ethiopia and the Ethiopian student movement. It's really among the most, I think, original and exciting parts of the volume. So let's show you a couple of images. These are interesting images. This is what Molly already referred to, you know, to ways in which, you know, we conceptualize or reconceptualize specific cities, you know, as hubs of transnational um, diffusion. Uh, so there are articles in the book that talk about Dar es Salaam, that there are articles that talk about Congo as hubs of, you know, a transnational diffusion in the sense that there are activists from all over the world, you know, mingling there and engaging in conversations that are not usually or typically recorded in the standard historiography of these places. And which were sometimes supportive and mutually reinforcing and in sometimes very conflictual because different activists on the ground in places like Dar es Salaam had different priorities. The Cubans, when they came in, wanted to recruit fighters uh, to go uh, wage war in the Congo in the interest of proletarian internationalism. Uh, and those in Dar es Salaam wanted actually more education and training so they could engage in the national liberation and nation building projects uh, that they wanted. And one of the areas that you know we really wanted to make sure to flesh out very very strongly is the area of um, the gender, um, you know, and sexuality study. In the sense that we wanted to give room to um, scholars working on feminism in non-Western countries and sort of explore the ways in which you know these South-South connections that Molly um, has has alluded to played out in this area and in many ways you know how these particular. Um, <coughs> you know, um, processes fed back into the Western discourse on feminism. There's particularly interesting one on the ways in which Asian American women were shaped by Vietnamese women's movements and brought that knowledge back uh, to their organizing on the West Coast. But really it's also to inspire, you know, more and more research, you know, in these particular areas, whether it's regarding Palestine, China, or <coughs> Eastern Europe, um, to make sure that 60s historians engage with that literature which is there uh, and which you know, people just need to um, engage in a larger dialogue with to incorporate into their particular 60s narrative. So that's part of this 
a particular project as well? Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> Maoism. One of the interesting things uh, is an article uh, by, uh, what's his name? Scarlett is the last name. Zachary. Zachary Scarlett. On uh, the Chinese efforts to appropriate the infatuation with Maoism and use it as part of their own propaganda for being uh, the most revolutionary country and the model which others should follow. So it complicates our understanding of the circulation and uses of Maoism, not only by others, but by the Chinese themselves. So one of the major areas um, that we focus on with the, um, you know, an essay in the book is the Tricontinental Conference, not uh, as an event, but also as something that is disseminated you know, through a variety of publications, a variety of you know, iconography in subsequent years. Uh, so there's an essay by Robert Young uh, in the book that retraces the various forms of publications that over the years emerged you know, from Cuba and essentially puts Cuba on the platform in the imagination of 60s activists across the world through the dissemination and translation of all of this material. So this is another area where we felt you know, there is additional research that could be done to think about the ways in which this was an orchestrated <coughs> campaign, clearly, but also the ways in which it was appropriated and selectively used in different locales for local uh, particular purposes. And again, we just like to admit it, you know, because they're really interesting, and the iconography of that uh, is really interesting to look at. And one of the wonderful things about being in a pre-internet age is that this stuff was actually printed and circulated, and in many cases, Preserved, and there really was an enormous effort to do this. For example, in Cairo, we had an essay on the competing Soviet and American efforts to set up sort of cultural affairs centers uh, and recruit intellectuals for their particular projects. So the idea is really to basically decenter and provincialize, if you like, Western narratives of the 60s by giving space to voices that deal with other parts of the world and trying to see how we can engage in a dialogue and thereby complicate our 60s narratives. That's essentially um, the bottom line of this particular um, endeavor. Um, and of course, looking at fantastic images, a very colorful and iconography, <laughs> very, very interesting um, to um, analyze. So, And the book concludes with an effort or, or a couple of different assessments about what the legacy of the global 60s were. Um, did it, in fact, uh, end in a defeat and leave no legacies? Was it counterproductive, as some have argued about the left in Western Europe and the US? Uh, does it offer ways to think about whether we might be now experience a new kind of political mobilization in its early stages that won't look like the 60s, but may take on the same global dimensions? But that's perhaps something we can talk about in the Q&A. Absolutely. And before we get to that, we have a very special privilege. We have one of the contributors with us. So uh, Manuji Nasrabadi, who is an NYU graduate, but also uh, is an assistant professor of women, gender, and sexuality studies at Barnard. So she's going to talk a little bit about her contribution, and then we can open it up um, for questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you. OK, thank you so much for having me here tonight. Thanks for coming, everyone. So I co-authored a chapter of the volume called The Iranian Student Movement and the Making of Global 1968. Um, and this image, just to tell you, it's not in the book, but um, it is from uh, what ended up being the largest Iranian student protest in the US um, outside the White House when the Shah and Carter were meeting in November 1977, um, right on the eve of kind of the outbreak of revolutionary um, upheaval in Iran. Um, I co-wrote the chapter with Afshin Matan Askari, um, on, and it focuses on the Confederation of Iranian Students, National Union, or CISNU. Um, and we, we decided to write the chapter together as a way of bringing together kind of the first and second generation of scholarship on um, the Iranian student opposition to the Shah. Um, Afshin is a historian whose monograph on the Confederation of Iranian Students really rescued that movement from the dustbin of history. Um, and from, in terms of myself, I'm an interdisciplinary second generation scholar, very much building on his work, but with also different concerns. Um, 
I'm really interested in mining this history or what it can tell us about how revolutionary subjectivities and subcultures take shape, and specifically about how the location of diaspora functions in that process. Um, so my approach in terms of this chapter was to combine archival research with um, in-depth interviews with participants to really try to excavate the quotidian experience of being an Iranian foreign student on the radical left in the US in the 1960s and 70s. Our chapter works to fill in some of the gaps in the scholarship concerning Iran in the global 60s, but also lacunae in Iranian studies scholarship on the Iranian left and the Iranian revolution, which has tended to be dismissive of student opposition activities outside Iran, particularly in terms of the leftists. Um, we're also addressing gaps in the emerging field of Iranian diaspora studies, which tends to focus on the period after the 1979 revolution and the flight of millions of Iranians, of Iranians from, um, from that um, revolution. So I just want to highlight in my time um, a few key dynamics that I think emerge in our chapter, which contribute, uh, can help us understand the global 60s. I think some of the more important dynamics of what we're calling the global 60s. So the first is that Iranian student opposition to the Shah was transnational by necessity. It emerged out of what I call a temporary diaspora of foreign students scattered across Western Europe, the US and Canada throughout the 1960s, and also to a lesser degree in uh, the Soviet Union, India, and Turkey in the 1970s. Um, so what are the conditions that produce this scattering, right? Um, the CIA-backed coup in Iran in 1953 brought an end to an era of unprecedented democratic organizing and hope. And I just wanted to put this image up there of a um, of demonstration by women and girls in support of the oil nationalization movement um, led by the National Front and Mohammad Mossadegh from 1953 right before the coup, just to give a little bit of an image to go with, you know, to try to help us think about that, that era and what it meant to bring that to um, an end. Um, and, and the coup really ushered in um, a, a new era of authoritarianism and economic modernization orchestrated through the so-called special relationship between the US and the Shah of Iran. Um, and just as a side note, because the Bandung Conference features so prominently in the historiography of this era, I think it's important to note that um, Iran doesn't really fit that standard periodization because by the time of 1955 and Bandung, um, the post-coup repression in Iran was really in full swing. And so it was the Shah's representative, complicit with the destruction of this nation democratic movement that we see pictured here, who uh, attended a and you know, represented Iran. So just an interesting side note. Um, so in the aftermath of the coup, there were really two major forces driving tens of thousands of Iranians to study abroad, um, eventually resulting in more than half of the entire college uh, population uh, leaving the country. The first was economic, the rapid, thoroughgoing forms of modernization undertaken through the U.S. Shah Alliance required a new class of professional technocrats and managers with certain kinds of expertise that can only be acquired through a Western education. Um, and a Western education was also supposed to instill in this class an affective and ideological attachment to the U.S. to help them internalize a pro U.S. worldview, which they would then propagate and defend back home. Um, the second force was dissident. For many college students who bristled at the Shah's repression and wished to become politically active, it made sense to go abroad for personal safety, but also to seek opportunities for organizing in the relatively more open, less immediately dangerous climate of Western universities. These dynamics make salient um, those forms of US Cold War imperialism that were at the time hidden to many people living in the West, even the activists. Um, whereas Vietnam was the glaring focal point for a new anti-imperialist left, it took an organized movement of Iranian foreign students to shine light on modalities of U.S. empire uh, for which Iran was a laboratory, and which the U.S. then deployed in numerous locations across the third world, including, for example, coup d'etats, economic development packages, and support for dictatorship, which of course included support for the torture and execution of political prisoners, um, at all as a form of regional Cold War policy. And so this, for example, is one flyer um, produced by the Iranian student movement um, in the US really trying to demonstrate, you know, behind the scenes of this glamorous um, Iranian royal family fed by US administration after US administration, what's really going 
what's really going on. So unlike with the classical empires of Europe, Iran showed how the US could skip that first phase of direct colonization and go straight to the forms of domination we now call neocolonialism. Um, it should come as no surprise then that most of the Iranians who studied abroad came to the US, for this was indeed the imperial metropole at the time. Um, the Iranian student population in the US hit a peak of 50,000 just before the 79 revolution. The special relationship between Iran and the US both paved the way for so many Iranians to study here and also created a set of sharp contradictions that would lead several thousand of these students to draw revolutionary conclusions. Um, and I'll just show this image of an uh, Iranian student occupation of the Statue of Liberty's crown, and they unfurled a banner reading down with the Shah, and another banner, free the, um, the 18, in reference to political prisoners in Iran. And this was really to epitomize those contradictions, right? That everything Statue of Liberty symbolized, um, you know, that, that really, in fact, what was going on was um, the US was supporting a brutal uh, dictatorship. Um, so, in this chapter, our close examination of the Confederation of Iranian Students offers insights into how transnational movements develop into multiple sites of affiliation, um, in relation to, sorry, in relation to multiple sites of affiliation and influence. I think this is one of the themes of thinking about the global 60s. For Iranian student activists abroad, their politics, strategies, and tactics have to be understood in relation to events unfolding within Iran um, various waves of protest and state repression, the development of the Iranian new left um, as a break with the Tuda or Communist Party of Iran, for example, um, but also in relation to events unfolding across the decolonizing world, um, the third world of which Iranian students insisted they were a part, and in relation to um, local radical student milieus on the campuses where they studied. So the location of diaspora made transnational politics something very concrete, something you could encounter in the bodies, histories, and ideas of other foreign students from across the third world uh, who were also studying uh, in, in uh, Western universities, as well as in dialogue with those young people in the West who were struggling in the belly of the beast, so to speak. Um, and it really was a two-way street as the Iranian student movement influenced and was influenced by other movements. One example um, in the chapter, in the section on Western Europe, um, talks about how uh, the catalyst in many ways for the Western German student protest movement was a June 1967 joint SDS CISNU uh, rally against a visit to West Berlin by the Shah, during which police shot and killed a German student. Um, this really ignited, it really radicalized um, and ignited the German protest movement. Um, the first, on the first anniversary of this death, um, 300 Iranian and 1,000 German students gathered, and the sister speaker who addressed the crowd said, quote, the common struggle of German and Iranian students is part of the worldwide movement against anti-popular, reactionary, and dictatorial ruling circles. Tokyo, Madrid, Rome, Saigon, Paris, Berlin, Athens, Tehran, Berkeley are all theaters of this struggle. So there was very much this sense, right, at the time, not only that there's a global struggle, but inserting Tehran, inserting Iran into that, right, as a site of kind of political and affective attachment for um, other, other activists. Um, in the Cold War imperial metropoles of US college campuses, Iranian student dissidents could meet and compare notes, this is the literal part of that typology, right, with many other students from Egypt, Ethiopia, Congo, Palestine, um, as well as talk to African American, Native American, Chicano, and Asian American student activists. Um, and this is just one slide um, of a joint meeting by the Arab Students Association and Iranian Students Association at San Jose State, trying to think about right, imperialism in the Middle East more regionally and working together, seeing their fates linked regionally um, together in this, in this way. Um, and these students could have these meetings and conversations, it's important to say, without the immediate threat of being thrown in prison and threatened with torture and execution, right? That was, it was much more difficult in Iran to organize any kind of a meeting, you know, like this. 
Um, the anti-imperialist and anti-racist frameworks of Third World Marxism and Maoism in particular made it possible for activists with distinct histories of colonization, migration, and dispossession to place their struggles in an affective, political, and practical proximity to one another and create capacious forms of internationalist solidarity. Radical students of all backgrounds responded by attending uh, rallies sponsored by the Iranian Students Association and picket lines. Um, this is one image from a protest um, in San Francisco in 1969. You can see the signs Vietnam, um, Iran, as well as in the back Arab students signs, right? You can see the kind of transnational connections literally coming together um, in, in this just one example of this demonstration. Um, but, you know, students from many different backgrounds would sign petitions to free political prisoners in Iran. They would organize joint events with the Iranian students. Um, there are student newspapers um, across the country published articles featuring um, the Iranian students' analysis of U.S. imperialism in Iran um, and the Shah's regional role in uh, enforcing U.S. Cold War domination throughout the Middle East and the Gulf. Um, and really working to add Iran to that list of places that a, a whole broad layer of Iranian student activists identified with in the context of a global revolutionary upsurge. Um, in the chapter, I focus on the relationship between the Iranian Students Association, which I don't know if I said was the US affiliate of the Confederation of um, Iranian Students. Um, I focus on the relationship between the ISA and the movement against the Vietnam War, primarily through joint organizing with SDS um, in the US, and also the ISA's relationship with anti-racist movements, primarily through their support for the Black Panther Party and their active involvement in the San Francisco State Third World Student Strike. And I'll just show this image here. Um, this is from one of the mass <coughs> mobilizations at San Francisco State during the strike, and in the second row, the disband here with the long hair, sorry for the bad image quality. Um, that is Khosrow Kalantari, an Iranian foreign student who is a leader of the local um, chapter of the ISA. And um, he and, and several other members of the chapter were involved in the strike um, the whole way through and even went to jail, which at that time was risking deportation. And if they had been sent back to Iran, they would have been threatened with, with torture and imprisonment there. So, you know, going taking great risks, right, to actually participate um, in these kinds of uh, acts of solidarity. Um, and I, I argue that this joint organizing went on not because Iranian students had the same demands um, or interests as their racialized American peers. In fact, Iranian foreign students were not minority citizens fighting discrimination in the US or for greater representation or inclusion in higher education. They didn't have those demands. But their opposition to the US Shah Alliance and to US imperialism everywhere placed them on the same side as people fighting those domestic American forms of injustice and state repression. Um, ISA involvement in particular in the campaigns to free Huey Newton, Bobby Seale, and Angela Davis are one concrete example. Um, this is a poster made by an ISA member, um, also a very well-known artist, um, Nikki Najumi um, in, in New York City in 1971 um, as part of the ISA's solidarity campaign. Um, so this is just one example of uh, you know, where the conditions and issues that these movements are facing are quite different, and yet the outrage and militancy in response to the plight of political prisoners in Iran and in the US could create the conditions for mutual support um, in places like Berkeley and New York City. Um, and it's also, I think, an example of the non-identitarian forms <laughs> of affiliation that flourished in the global 60s. Um, which did not ignore the specificity of oppression, of history, but rather opened out from a particular lived experience and a particular location into a shared way of feeling about and responding to injustice in many forms. Um, the chapter only touches very briefly on the gender and sexual politics of uh, CISNU or the Iranian student movement abroad. Um, but in my larger project, this is a major focus and concern of my research where I try to tease out, um, you know, using the Iranian student movement as a kind of case study of um, 
third world Marxist uh, organizations at the time and try, trying to tease out what elements of the gender and sexual politics of the movement were specific to Iranian culture and history and context and, um, and which ones actually were transnational and were constitutive of the revolutionary left more broadly, especially through uh, this shared framework of, uh, of Maoism, the way it was taken up um, in different places. There's a lot in common, actually. Um, so just to conclude briefly, um, the main points that emerge out of our chapter um, concerning the Iranian student revolutionary movement abroad, which I think help us to better understand the making of the global 60s, concern the role of um, Cold War imperial and economic agendas in creating the structural conditions in which transnational movements come into being, um, and the way these contradictions work to radicalize a generation of young Iranians. Uh, we also look at the role Iranian students played in radicalizing students in the West, and how new forms of internationalism, solidarity, and non-identitarian affiliations were forged as multiple diasporic populations, right, of foreign students and racialized Americans, in the case of the US, came into contact with one another and recognized in one another a familiar determination to fight for freedom against all the odds. Thank you. Thank you.